So a lot of the work I'm going to talk about today was done jointly with Timothy Lillicrap. As I talk, my voice will get weirder and weirder um, because I've got a small polyp growing on one vocal cord. And as I talk, my, I'll start producing two notes at the same time. Um, so back propagation, just to be sure you all know, takes an input vector. You go forwards through a multilayer neural net with nonlinear units. You compare with the correct answer, you backpropagate something backwards, derivatives, and then you adjust all the weights. And despite what people thought for a long time, it works great. Um, if you're interested in it for the brain, then you would do um, online stochastic learning. That is, you would take a training example, you go forwards, you go backwards, and you update the weights a little bit. And in statistical terms, you're getting an exponential expectation of the full gradient. That is, you get a noisy version of the full gradient from just one training case. On average, it's right. Um, of course, it's a long way off. Um, and that learning technique you'd have thought was crazy, but actually it works quite well, as long as you don't learn too fast. So the question is, could the cortex be doing this? And if you talk to neuroscientists, or look at the things neuroscientists have said over the ages, um, they're until very recently, they were all completely convinced that this was crazy. Most of them didn't understand what you meant because they thought backpropagation meant sending um, spikes backwards down the um, dendritic tree. And they, that is backpropagation. That's a different form of backpropagation. And you need that for doing many of these algorithms. And they didn't understand that it was the idea of backpropagation was to send error derivatives from one cortical area to an earlier cortical area. Um, it's the right thing to do. And it seems to be completely crazy, it would be completely crazy for evolution not to figure out a way of modifying early feature detectors so that they're useful for later feature detectors. We can all think of a dumb algorithm for doing that, which is you change them at random, see if it helps, but that's hopelessly inefficient. Bank propagation is just that dumb algorithm, change them and see if it helps, except that it's more efficient by a factor of the number of connections. So if you've got a billion connections, it's a billion times more efficient than tinkering with the weights at random. Um, and so you'd have thought evolution would have discovered that. Um, but neuroscientists actually have a bunch of good reasons why it's not possible. And I'm going to go over four of those reasons. I don't know whether the brain can do backprop. But what I do know is the arguments neuroscientists use um, aren't very good. Um, so the first reason is there's no obvious source of supervision. In backpropagation, you, I'm talking for a feed-forward network, not a recurrent network here. For a feed-forward network, you go forwards, someone injects the right answer, you compare it with what you got, and you send something backwards. And there's nobody to inject the right answer in the brain. It's not like your mother has a little electrode into the middle of your brain, much as much that she would like that. Um, a second reason is that cortical neurons don't send real values to each other. And in backpropagation, as is normally used, you're communicating real values in the forward pass and real value derivatives backwards. So Francis Crick was very fond of this reason. He said backpropagation is crazy. Um, neurons don't communicate real values, and so it can't be doing it. Um, the next argument, which I think is one of the best arguments why it can't be done, is to do it in the obvious way, neurons would need to send two different signals. When you go forwards, a neuron sends a signal that says, this feature is here, or this feature is here to this extent. So that's the activity of the neuron. That's what it represents. When you're going backwards, that same neuron needs to send a completely different signal, which is, how fast would the error change if I were to change my total input that I received from the layer below? That's a completely different quantity. And obviously, the neuron can't be sending both quantities. Um, I'll refer to the output of the neuron as y and the total input to the neuron as x. And so on the forward pass, it needs to send y. And on the backward pass, it needs to send de by dx. And the last thing is, back propagation you, in back propagation, you go forwards through the weights, and then you go backwards through the same weights. So in matrix terms, you use the transpose of the forward matrix to send the error derivatives backwards. And there's lots of evidence in the brain that if you have two cortical areas and there's forwards connections, there will be backwards connections. And if there's forwards connections from one region of a cortical area, there will be backwards connections to that region of the cortical area. But they're not point to point. So if a neuron here sends a forwards connection there, it's not that this neuron sends a backwards connection there. In fact, the backwards connections go to different neurons. So um, that seems like a major problem. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just go through these four arguments and show how the main aim of this talk is to show none of them are really insuperable obstacles. 
And when you combine that with the idea that we now know it works really well, it suddenly becomes plausible, I think, that the brain might be doing something that's backpropagation or something very close to backpropagation. So first, the source of supervision. Um, people doing backpropagation have worried about this problem for a long time. And in the 80s, we thought that, well, one way to get a source of supervision is to do reconstruction. So you're trying to encode the data and then reconstruct the data. And you take the reconstruction error and backpropagate it. So you don't need an extra supervision signal. You're just trying to reconstruct the data. That's what PCA is doing. And backpropagation is just nonlinear PCA. Um, another idea about how you might do get an error signal is you might extract local features. And then you might compare what the features in the layer below say a feature detector ought to be doing. So the whole issue here is you have feature detectors in the intermediate layers, and they need to figure out what they should be doing. And one thing to do is say it's going to extract some stuff from below, and then it's going to get a prediction from above from the broader context, and it wants to make those two the same. It wants to make the prediction from the broader context agree with what it extracts from below. And so a little example of that in a sentence is nice one trial learning. I give you a sentence like this one. She scrummed in with the frying pan. And you've never heard the word scrummed before. And you have a pretty good idea of what it means in one trial. I think. It's sort of, she bashed him with it somehow, right? Um, probably because of something sexist he said. Um, and what's happening here is there's a certain amount of information in this character string here, these seven characters. Like the ED tells you it's very likely a verb in the past tense of a verb. Um, there may be some information in scrummed, just that, that doesn't sound good. Um, but basically what's happening is the context um, tells you what that's likely to mean. And in one trial, you can get a good idea of, uh, you can get some evidence about what that means. And that's just an example of something you can detect locally, like scrummed, and the context it's in, and you want to make those agree. Okay. A somewhat more principled way to get a learning signal, though not necessarily better, is to say, let's learn a generative model that assigns high log probability to the input data. So for vision, let's learn a graphics model um, that generates things that look like the images we actually see. Um, for complex nonlinear models, that's tricky. But if instead of trying to maximize the log probability of the input data, you try and maximize a variational bound on it, um, then you can make complex models much, more, much easier to learn. And that works pretty well. Um, and if you then are willing to make a further approximation and say, you've got this variational bound that's motivating you, and you're not even going to optimize that, you're going to optimize an approximation to that, you can get a very simple algorithm called the wake sleep algorithm. Um, yes, I was going to put in a description of how it works here, but I can give you the description of how it works. Um, you have some, oh, actually, no, no, I did animation. I confused myself. Yes, there you go. Um, there's a wake phase where you go forwards um, through these red connections, which are recognition connections, and that uh, determines the activities of these hidden layers. And then you do learning of the other connections. So now we're going to learn these connections, and we're going to train these to be good at reconstructing whatever it was in this layer that caused it. So whatever it was in H2 that caused the pattern in H3, you try and reconstruct it from the pattern in H3. You do a reconstruction, you look at the error, and you change these weights to Get rid of that error. And notice there's no backpropagation needed here. That learning can be done sort of at a synapse here. It sees um, the state of H2 um, that was there previously. It sees the state of H2 that's there when it does the reconstruction. And it gets as input on the activity of H3. And so you can learn this synapse here without having to do backprop. And that really is uh, the, the right thing to learn. Um, to maximize the probability of regenerating this from that. Um, and you can do that sort of independently at all the layers. And then the, wake the sleep phase, what you do is you generate data from your model. So I start with random vectors up here, generated according to the biases of these units. I generate downwards. And then for each pair of layers, I try and reconstruct what actually caused this activity in the layer above. And I assume independence. It's a variational method, so I make an assumption there. I assume these are independent causes of this. Um, 
or rather in the posterior, they're independent. And so you get a very simple learning algorithm. It's not actually following the derivative of the variational bound, because unfortunately the variational bound is a KL of QP, where Q is your approximating distribution and P is the right distribution. And this is optimizing um, KLPQ. But it works pretty well. Um, and it's very simple. There's no backpropagation required. And so in 1995, we were quite excited about that, that we had an alg algorithm that could learn multiple layers of representation without doing any backpropagation. And it worked um, moderately well. It learned sensible layers of feature detectors. But it wasn't as good as real backprop. Um, so you'll notice the training of these weights and training of those weights uses exactly the same process. Now, there's some crazy things about it. Like when you're awake, you don't learn the recognition connections. We really thought this was wake and sleep. And when you're asleep, um, you don't learn generative connections. Um, so that means you get to the end of a day and you haven't learned to recognize things any better during the day. You have to go to sleep. Um, that doesn't seem plausible. Half asleep. Yeah, half asleep. Um, well, you could alternate. There's new methods for unsupervised learning. So the problem we had that led to the wake sleep algorithm and that meant it wasn't doing quite the right thing was that for this deep net, we couldn't get the exact derivatives of the variational bound with respect to the recognition weights. The learning algorithm had the exact derivatives of the variational bound with respect to the generative weights, but not with respect to those recognition weights. And then Max Welling and the student of his called Kingma came up with a very clever trick that allowed, that, I'm amazed that you can do it, that allowed you to actually get the exact derivatives. That is something whose expected value is the exact derivative. And so now people can learn these variational autoencoders much better. Um, there's also other new methods of doing unsupervised learning, or rather sort of getting a supervision signal without being given a separate supervision signal. So Ian Goodfellow and his collaborators have a thing called generative adversarial nets, where you have a net that generates data, let's suppose it's images, and to begin with, it doesn't generate very good images, it generates rubbish. You have another net that looks at real images and looks at the images generated by this net. And it has to tell you whether what it's just seen is a real image or an image that came from this net. So it's learning to tell the difference between what the net produced and what real images look like. So it's an adversary. And now if you back propagate through the adversary, you can figure out how to change the generated images so it's harder for the adversary to tell the difference between them and real images. So you get a signal that tells you how to generate images that are more difficult to distinguish from the real ones, according to this adversary. But if you now keep learning the two together, it starts generating really good images. If you show it lots and lots of scenes of bedrooms and just the furniture, and um, you then get it to generate, it generates things that are not particularly like any of the scenes it's seen, but you look at them and you say, that's a bedroom. It's amazing. Um, okay, so there's lots, new, lots of new unsupervised learning algorithms coming up. And my conclusion from all this, I'm not going to pick one of them as the best way to get a supervision signal. But my conclusion is there's many different ways to get supervision signals that you can use with backpropagation. Um, so we don't actually have to inject a separate label. So that objection doesn't really kill backpropagation. There's lots of other ways you can get signals that you backpropagate that will allow you to do learning. So that's not a major objection. Now the next objection, can neurons communicate real values? Um, so normally when you do backpropagation, you send a real number forwards, that's the output of a unit, and um, you also send real numbers backwards, which are error derivatives. But as a matter of fact, people didn't try this for a long time. If you take logistic units, which are sending, they're between 0 and 1, and they're going to send some real value forwards like 0.73, um, if you just randomly quantize that, so 0.73 of the time you send a 1, and 0.27 of the time you send a 0, so it's got the same expected value, the algorithm works just fine. Um, when you're actually computing the error derivatives for the incoming weights of a unit, you make use of the fact that it's a 0.73, but you never need to communicate that outside the neuron. Um, outside the neuron, you just do this stochastic communication. Also, it works just fine if when you're back propagating errors from one layer to the next, you use two bits. You use one bit to say whether it's positive or negative, and another bit to say 
um, whether it's one or zero, or whether it's epsilon or zero, and you have to choose an epsilon so that most of the error derivatives are smaller than epsilon. And now you can stochastically communicate the backpropagated derivatives with the right expected value, and backprop will work just fine. Um, so it is actually very robust to sending noisy things that have the right expected value. We're now going to have a digression about statistics, and I'm going to argue that actually the fact that neurons send spikes rather than real values is an advantage. It's better than sending real values. This sounds odd. I mean, the neurons are roughly I'm going to model them as a Poisson process. We all know they're more complicated than that, but that's a good start. Um, that sends spikes um, randomly from some underlying rate. And the question is, how could that be better than sending an accurate real number? Well, it all depends on um, ideas about statistics. And we've all been grossly misled by the professionals who are called statisticians. Um, so frequent statisticians will tell you things. You probably learned these when you were very young. Like, you shouldn't have more parameters than training cases. Because if you have more parameters than training cases, you can model anything. Um, Bayesian statisticians are a bit more liberal. They'll say, you can have more parameters than training cases, but you better integrate over the posterior. Well, I don't want to do either of those things. I want to have hugely more parameters than training cases, and I don't want to have to integrate over the posterior, um, because that's what the brain does. And so there must be some regime for learning where this works. And the regime the brain in is totally unlike anything statisticians have studied, or anything that nearly all statisticians have studied. Um, the models they study are tiny models. Until quite recently, they were models with, say, 100 parameters and 1,000 training cases. Now they're still tiny models with, say, 100 million parameters and a billion training cases. These are tiny compared with the brain. Trillions of times smaller. Well, billions, anyway. Um, the brain's got about 10 to the 14 parameters. That's synapses, um, most of which seem to be adaptive, or a large fraction are adaptive. And you only live for 10 to the 9 seconds. Um, actually, it's 2 times 10 to the 9, which is very lucky for some of us. Um, so you've got about, you've got at least 10,000 synapses per second, or about 100,000 synapses a second. That's how, many, that's how many parameters you burn throughout your lifetime. And presumably the brain does this because a synapse Supporting a synapse for your entire lifetime is much cheaper than having one experience, one tenth of a second experience um, for your whole body. Um, so synapses are really cheap, and the brain manages to compute with them very cheaply, only using about 30 watts or so for 10 to the 14 of them. Um, and so it needs a way to throw lots and lots of parameters at a relatively small amount of data compared with the number of parameters it's got. That was the evolutionary requirement on the brain, and presumably it's figured out how to do that. And actually, it turns out statisticians know a way of doing that. Statisticians already know a way in which you can get a better, as you have more parameters, your model gets better and better. It just doesn't get better and better very fast. Um, so this is big data versus big models. Um, we all know big data is good, um, mainly because it's increased, it caused all our salaries to go up a bit. Um, although it's still not as high as the salaries of our recently, recent graduate students, but there you go. Um, so we know that for any given size of model, more data is better. Kind of the best regularizer you can get from a model is more data. So just get more data. But I'm arguing it's a bad idea to do what statisticians have always recommended, which is make your model so small that whatever size data set you have, it looks big. It's bigger than the number of parameters in your model. That's what frequent statisticians typically recommend. Um, big models are good. And for any, here's what statisticians don't believe, um, but it's true. Um, for any given size of data, the bigger you make the model, the better you'll do. Not just at fitting the data, but at generalizing. It has to be complicated enough data to be worth a big model, of course. Um, provided you regularize it well. In other words, there are regularizers that are so good that um, it's always pays to have more data and a stronger regularizer. And statisticians know something like that, which is if you use an ensemble. If you have an ensemble of 50 different models, and I say, OK, would you like to have 100 different models? That's twice as many parameters. 
And we draw models from some distribution and train them independently and so on. So they're all trying to get the right answer. Um, almost certainly having more models is going to give you a slightly better answer. So you can always make use of more parameters by just adding models to an ensemble, models of a fixed size to an ensemble. Um, the question is, is there a more efficient way to use more parameters than that? Um, but because of this, and because there are more efficient ways to use more parameters, um, I think it's a good idea to always try to make the data look small by using a huge model. Now, this relies on you having almost free computation. Obviously, one of the reasons statisticians didn't want to have big models was they start off doing the calculations by hand, and then they use pocket calculators, and then they use computers and so on. And until very recently, um, computers were so slow that you couldn't really afford to have very big models. And in fact, they're still so slow. So if you take a plausible size model like 10 to the 14 parameters, the computers are still too slow to be able to fit that to a large amount of data. Uh, a relatively small amount of data, but say a billion training cases. We'd like to fit 10 to the 14 parameters to a billion training cases. Computers are still much too slow, but I believe NVIDIA is working on it. Um, OK. So I'm just going to talk about one regularizer that works quite nicely because I'm particularly attached to it. Um, you can use a lot of parameters by having an ensemble of models and adding more models to the ensemble. But you can make that more efficient by letting models within the ensemble actually share information uh, so that you get more knowledge per parameter. Just having a gazillion models is a very inefficient way of using a lot of parameters. So we're going to somehow let the models in an ensemble share information. And here's the idea. I've talked about this before, actually, at Stanford, so I'm going to go over it rather quickly. Um, let's have a neural net with one hidden layer. Each time you show a training example, you leave out each unit with a probability of 0 0.5. Um, so if you've got h hidden units, you have 2 to the h different models now. And each time, you're going to just use one model. So for each training example, we use one of these models selected at random. And so most of these 2 to the h models will never see a single training example. Um, but the trick is, all of these models are going to share the incoming weights. So if two models both use a unit, they'll use it with the same incoming weights. So they're doing massive parameter sharing. And that's a much better regularizer. Having your parameter be like the parameter value that some other model wants is a much better regularizer than just having it be close to 0, for example, which is what L1 and L2 decay are trying to do. Um, so that's the idea of dropout. And you train by, on each training example, you randomly leave out half the hidden units. Um, when you test, you put them all in and use half the size of the outgoing weights. And if you're using a softmax up here, then when you test, what you get is exactly the geometric mean of the predictions of all 2 to the h models. So there's an efficient way to get your model average. Now, if you have multiple layers, um, then when you use half the outgoing weights, that's just an approximation. Um, but it still works pretty well. So dropout allows you to make models much bigger. It makes training slower because, A, there's more noise. So even for a model of the same size, it would be slower to train. And B, you need to make the models bigger because you're on each occasion, you're dropping out many of the units. But what it's really doing is it's preventing units collaborating too much, so it's preventing overfitting. Similarly, when you use an ensemble, having lots of small models prevents any collaboration at all between parameters in different models. And that's what stops overfitting. Here, we're going to have some collaboration, but we're going to try and minimize it by saying, I don't know which other hidden unit's going to be left out, so I can't rely on what he said, and I can't adjust my parameter values so that it works with this other hidden unit. I have to be sort of more independent than that. OK. Um, there's people here who've studied dropout and know much more about it than I do. Um, but it works. And at test time, you halve the outgoing weights and just do a forward pass. And that approximately computes the geometric average of all of your models. Now, you can view dropout as using Bernoulli noise, where you take a neuron. You compute what its output should be, and you either and you either send zero or you send twice that. 
let's suppose we use probability 0.5 dropout. So if you either send zero or you send twice the activation, the expected value is the same as the activation, but there's some noise in it. So you're sending the right expected value, but with noise. Well, a Bernoulli distribution, it has a, a standard deviation equal to the activation, because you're either going to send, instead of sending the activation, you're either going to send twice of it, or noise, or zero. And so the standard deviation is equal to the activation. Um, you could try using Gaussian noise that had that same standard deviation and that same mean value. So that would say use multiplicative Gaussian noise on the activations of the units where the standard deviation of the multiplicative Gaussian noise is equal to the activation. That's a lot of multiplicative Gaussian noise. Obviously, you can use less or more. But if you use that amount of Gauss, Gaussian noise, it works about the same as using dropout. I was really hoping it would work worse because there's this cute property that dropout has a certain standard deviation and it minimizes the entropy of the distribution for that standard deviation. And Gaussian multiplicative noise has the same mean as standard deviation but maximizes the entropy of the distribution. And you'd have thought minimizing versus maximizing might make it work different. Actually, it's pretty much the same. And if anything, um, the Gaussian noise is just slightly better, which is very annoying. Um, but you can also use um, sort of fake Poisson noise. So rather than actually implementing a Poisson process, what you can do is you can say, I'm going to try and get something that has the same mean and variance as a Poisson process. I'm going to have multiplicative noise, but the standard deviation of the noise is now going to be the square root of the activation value. So the proportional noise gets less as the activation value gets bigger. And that works fine too. And that strongly suggests that um, if you use a Poisson process that has the same mean and variance as this Poisson multiplicative noise, um, then that'll work too. I haven't actually implemented that because my graduate students all went off and got jobs and I didn't feel like doing it myself, but um, it's bound to work. Okay. So the conclusion about sending accurate real values is this. If what a neuron does is computes an underlying rate, which is a real value, and then sends Poisson spikes according to that rate, what it'll achieve is, in expectation it's sending the real value, but it's adding a huge amount of Poisson noise to it. But adding a huge amount of noise is a very good thing to do if you're in the regime the brain is in. That's what allows you to use 10 to the 14 parameters with only 10 to the 9 training points. Um, so, Actually, it's not a problem that you're only sending these all or none noisy spikes. It's actually better than being able to send real numbers, accurate real numbers. OK, so that's the end of that objection. Um, now, having claimed that, what, we're, what I'm going to do is say, well, look, if I give you a theory that works when I send real numbers forwards and backwards, you can always turn it into a theory that works when I send spikes, which is just the same theory but with plus on, lots of plus on noise as the regularizer. So from now on, I'll assume I'm sending real numbers um, for most of what I'm going to say. But if I can do it with real numbers now, I can do it with spikes. OK, so the next question, the next of the four questions is, how do we send the error derivatives backwards? So it's obvious that um, if the output of a neuron represents the presence of a feature in the current input, you can't also use the output of that neuron to represent the derivative of the error with respect to um, the total input received by that neuron, which is what you need to communicate backwards in backpropagation. So you've got a problem. You can't actually use the same neuron to send stuff backwards. So it obviously has to be a different neuron. What's more, when you send stuff backwards, um, this different neuron has to sometimes send positive error derivatives and sometimes send negative error derivatives. That is, the sign of the thing it's cha sending changes. And the effect those have has to change sign too. And there's a thing in neuroscience called Dale's Law, which says the neurons are either excitatory or inhibitory, and they can't change the effect they have. They can't change from having a positive effect to having a negative effect. So one neuron will violate Dale's Law. That's why in feed-forward things, you have things like on-center, off-surround neurons and off-center, on-surround neurons. Um, you have a pair of neurons to deal with the sign reversal. Um, and so presumably, you need pairs of neurons to deal with the reversal of um, the sign of the error derivative. So it's obvious that 
um, you can't use the same neurons to send the error signal backwards. But actually, that's all nonsense. Um, so here's how you do it. So this is the sort of biggest claim. This is the sort of central claim of this talk. That there is a way to represent error derivatives in the brain, which makes it very easy to do backpropagation. In fact, if you represent error derivatives this way, backpropagation just emerges. Um, it's just an emergent property of using this representation of error derivatives, plus a few other things. And the idea is this. Um, if you've got a signal and you want to represent two things, well, you could represent one thing by the value of a signal and another thing by the rate at which that value is changing. And at least over a short time period, you have two independent quantities now, the value and the rate of change of the value. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say the output of a neuron represents what's going on in the world, and the rate at which that output is changing does not represent how fast that property of the world is changing. So if I've got a neuron that represents where something is, when it's active it says it's here, if the activity of that neuron changes, it doesn't mean that it's moving. The, the rate of change of the neuron is going to represent an error derivative. If the brain does that, it's a really basic decision it's made, because it can no longer use rates of change of quantities for representing that that quantity changed. And in fact, the brain seems to be like that. You can't use the rate of change of the activation of a position-sensitive neuron to represent the velocity of something. If you want to represent velocity, you use a different neuron. And if you want to represent acceleration, you don't use the rate of change of the output of a velocity neuron, you use a different neuron that represents acceleration. And so some people get brain damage and where they lose the velocity-sensitive neurons, and then they can see the position of a car, and then they can see the cars here, but it didn't move. Um, it's kind of the opposite of a waterfall effect, where you see things are moving, but in the same position. OK. Um, so let me show you an, uh, a very early use of this idea that you can use temporal derivatives of the outputs to encode error derivatives with respect to the inputs. This was done in 1988 by, it's actually done in 1987 by um, Jay McClelland and me. Um, the year is actually quite significant, I think, because I'm fairly sure that at that time people hadn't yet discovered spike time dependent plasticity. And what I'll show you is this is actually a spike time dependent plasticity rule. So we predicted it, we just predicted it with the wrong sign. Um, so this is for an autoencoder. What you do is you take an input. Um, you want to train these green weights so they will reconstruct the input and thereby get some interesting representations in these layers. And I've shown it for a, what I call a long loop. That's a loop that's greater than just up and down again. Um, the algorithm works most simply for a short loop, but I've now made it work for a long loop using logistic units. Um, and the idea is this. You start with random weights. You send the input round, this, round the loop once. So the first time round is green. That'll give you something different here from what the real input was. Um, you then send it round again. So that's that red pathway. And you take the difference between the activation the first time you sent things round and the second time you th sent things round. And you say, I'm going to use that as an error derivative. I'm going to change the incoming weights here so as to reduce that difference. And it will actually learn to be an autoencoder. And notice there's no backpropagation. Um, it's actually just, well, you might call this backpropagation because you get information from there to there. But it doesn't look any different from the forward propagation here. Um, it also answers the question, how can I, yeah, how can I learn these weights when the only pathway is sort of from there, to get information from here to there, is this. It, it actually works. It doesn't work as well as standard backprop, but you can make it work. Um, and so the learning rule for a neuron here is to say, change the incoming weights of that neuron in proportion to the activity of this neuron in the layer below times the rate of change of this neuron. And you put in a minus sign, because what you want is that the thing that happened first is right, and the thing that happened second is bad. You're wandering away from the right thing. And so you want to pull it back to the right thing. So the thing, if the thing that happened first is right and the thing that happened second is bad, you need a minus sign here to make the learning go in the right direction. 
And so that's the opposite of spike time dependent plasticity. I will elaborate the connection to spike time dependent plasticity in a minute. Um, but you can actually combine it with spike time dependent plasticity with the right sign in the following way. I gave a talk at NIPS about this in 2007, which met with universal incomprehension. Um, you first you can use spike time dependent plasticity to sorry reverse spike time dependent plasticity to learn a bunch of stacked autoencoders. So you learn one autoencoder, you then take the hidden states of it, you learn to autoencode those, and you can pile up a bunch of stacks like that. So think of those as cortical areas. Um, that are learning representations based on the input. And then our problem is, if we know something about what we'd like the final output to be, can we get that to influence the early connections? So what you're going to do now is, having learned the autoencoders and got them working quite well, you're going to do a downwards pass for all the way from the top, just one downwards pass that uses whatever representation came out of your stack of autoencoders when you showed it the data. So that's your prediction. And then you're going to correct your prediction um, with the right answer by regressing it towards the right, right answer and do another downwards pass. And you're going to use the difference in activations on those two downward passes as your derivative of the error with respect to the input of each unit. Um, and that corresponds to spike time dependent plasticity with the correct sign because the bad thing came first and the good thing came second. So what comes second is better than what came first. So let's just have a look at that. So here's spiked independent plasticity. This is what neuroscientists observed. Um, you have a presynaptic spike. Let's suppose it occurs here. So an incoming spike. And then the neuron... Um, fires at some point. If it fires before the presynaptic spike, what happens is the weight connecting the two goes down. And if it fires after the presynaptic spike, the weight goes up. It's normally interpreted by neuroscientists as, could this presynaptic spike have caused this neuron to fire? If it could have caused it, let's increase the connection strength. But I want to give you a different interpretation. Um, if you look at this thing, it looks like a derivative filter. And if what you want is to change the connection strength by the activity on the input times the rate of change of the output, then what you need to do is take that stream of output spikes, apply a derivative filter to them, and use the output of that derivative filter as the postsynaptic term in your learning rule. And so you're really asking, did the rate of firing, is the rate of firing higher here or here? And if the rate of firing is higher here, you want to increase the weight. And if the rate of firing is higher here, you want to decrease the weight. That's the right learning rule if you're using the change in the rate of firing to represent the error derivative. And it's the change in this underlying rate of firing. You only get a noisy observation of this because you just see some spikes. Um, but this thing will give you the right expected value. And for stochastic online gradient descent, all you have to do is get the expected values right and it'll work. It's very robust to all the noise. So you can interpret spike down to plasticity as the signature of a system that's using the rate of change of the output to represent the error derivative with respect to the input. Now let me show you that in a bit more detail. Um, yeah. Uh, so the, if you do a forward pass through a bunch of stacked autoencoders, and then you do two backward passes, um, one from whatever you produced and one from the right answer, um, that difference will give you um, your learning signal. Um, if you want to make it more continuous, what you do is you go forwards, you get, the right you get your prediction, and then you gradually blend your prediction with the right answer. So you regress your prediction towards the right answer. And then as you're doing backward passes, the rate of change of the neurons, as you gradually do this regression, will be the postsynaptic term 
that you need to multiply the presynaptic activity by to do backpropagation. And I'm going to show you that now, hopefully. So, so this is sort of the technical idea of this. I'm going to use the rate of change of the output of neuron j, that is y dot j, to represent dE by dxj. Um, I have some target value. I have some output probability when I've driven the system bottom up, when it's making a prediction. And so what we do is we say, let's start off with the output the neuron actually produced. And then as time goes by, let's change that by regressing it, by starting there, and then adding in some of the desired output and removing some of the actual output. So we're just regressing towards the desired output. If you differentiate that with respect to t, you'll see you just get dj minus yj0. And so the rate of change of the output in the top layer is going to be proportional to the derivative of the cross-entropy error, because that's what the cross-entropy error looks like. And that's the derivative of the cross-entropy with respect to the input to a neuron in the last layer. Um, <coughs> Just so we're all on the same page, here's what you need to do to do backpropagation. You need to start off by getting this thing, the derivative of the error with respect to the output. And then you need to convert that into the derivative of the error with respect to the input. And we're going to do that, um, we're going to represent this thing as y dot j. The rate of change of the output of the neuron is going to be representing this. Now we want to get the same quantity in the previous layer. If we can do that, we can do backpropagation. And so what I want to show is that if you train a stack of autoencoders and do this backward pass with the time-changing activities, um, then if you get the output units so that dE by dxj is, representing, is represented by y dot j, then automatically, in a stack of autoencoders, um, the units in the layer below, um, the same thing will be true. The y dot i will be representing dE by dxi. Now the way you do that in backprop is, you take this quantity, you multiply it by the slope of the nonlinearity here, dy by dx. Um, that's, already, that's another problem for the brain. The brain has neurons that aren't very stable. I mean, they adapt rapidly in things. So their nonlinearities keep changing slope. And so it can't actually know the slope of the nonlinearity because it keeps wandering around. And the method I'm going to show you, that has no problem with that because it actually measures the nonlinearity, the slope of the nonlinearity, rather than um, knowing it. So anyway, um, you need to do that. And then you need to, this is the basic backprop step, you need to take, um, this quantity for every neuron in that layer, you need to multiply it by the weight on the connection, but going in the other direction. And you need to add it all up. And for neuron i here, that will give you dE by dyi. You then need to take this quantity you computed by adding up all these backwards coming things and put it through the slope of the nonlinearity there. So you need to multiply by this thing in order to get dE by dxi. And I'm going to show you an easy way to do that. So, let's have two output neurons and one neuron in the layer before, just to keep the diagram simple. And let's first do a forward pass. There's more layers down here. So we do a forward pass. These are the output neurons. We get some actual outputs here. We now start regressing those actual outputs towards their desired values. And we now replace, for this neuron, we replace the bottom-up input by top-down input that comes from these guys. So to begin with, the top-down input this neuron gets is yj times wji plus yk times wki. And because this thing's been trained as an autoencoder, that top-down input ought to reconstruct what was here. So what was here shouldn't change much when you compute it using the green connections instead of computing it bottom up. 
if these two layers formed a good autoencoder, you can reconstruct whatever was here from the activities in the layer above by going backwards through these weights. And when you train a restricted Boltzmann machine, that's exactly what you're doing. You're using the same top-down weights as the bottom-up weights and training it to be good at reconstructing, at least if you train it with contrast divergence. Here. Um, okay. So when I use the green connections instead of the black connection, when I first use them, when I have the actual outputs, this neuron won't change much. But now I start changing these guys by regressing them towards the correct values, the desired values, the target values. So now what happens here? Well, what's coming along the green connection here will be changing. And the rate at which it will change will be how fast this guy changes times the value of this weight. And what's coming along here will be changing. It'll be how fast this guy changes times the value of this weight. So the total input to this neuron here will be changing by wji times y dot j plus wki times y dot k. I apologize to mathematicians. I never understand equations. I always understand it by using a particular example. Um, so now, we can ask, how fast does the output of yi change? Well, the output of yi change will change at a rate that's the rate of change of the input, which is what we can do here, times the slope of the nonlinearity. Notice we didn't need to know the slope of the nonlinearity. This just happens. Whatever the slope of the nonlinearity is here, if you change this top-down signal that's being used to reconstruct, it'll change what comes out, and the slope of the nonlinearity will get into the act. Um, and that is, if you take this guy and that guy, and if it was the case that um, y dot j and y dot k were representing the error derivatives with respect to the inputs here, it will just happen that y dot i represents the error derivative with respect to the input to this guy. So that is the kind of recursive step in back propagation. The idea is, um, and it just happens automatically using these error derivatives using these temporal derivatives as error derivatives. And you don't need to know, you can use neurons that wander around, you don't need to know the slope of the nonlinearity, because here, you're getting this effect by just putting in a changing input and seeing how the output changes. It's kind of weird, because if you want the error derivative with respect to the output, um, you sort of do your computations here. Once, and once you've taken the error derivative with respect to the output that you computed here, you put it forwards through the neuron, and you get the error der derivative with respect to the input in these rates of change. Isn't that just, just an edge on it? Sorry? It's basically a gradient yeah. using the edge on yeah. yeah. That's what common yeah. filters and everything else does. Yeah, it's, it's done. I agree. It's just that neuroscientists uh, were determined that the brain couldn't do this. Yeah. Well, I've already, I've already let you know what I think of statistics. Um, <laughs> At least when it comes to very big numbers. Um, so I already said this. If you're using these temporal derivatives as error derivatives, you can't um, also use temporal derivatives to represent the temporal derivatives of things, of quantities in the world. And so we get to the last problem. And this caused me to give up on this idea in 2007. I thought, OK, I got this far, but it's actually hopeless. And the reason it's hopeless is because it requires the top down weights to be the same as the bottom up weights. And in particular, it requires, if I've got two neurons with a connection this way, I better have a connection the other way. Um, that's not what the brain's like. You don't have this pointwise connectivity. You have some connections going this way, and some other connections going to the same big area coming back, but not to the same neurons. I mean, by coincidence, it might occasionally happen, but in general, it doesn't. So. You don't have this basic property of backprop, which is that when the signal comes backwards, it comes backwards through the transpose of the weight matrix through which it went forwards. And that seems to be essential for backprop. Um, so, um, how could this possibly work if you had a neural net in which you've got sparse connections in both directions with not much overlap between the pairs of neurons that are connected in the two directions. Well, you need a miracle. Um, and in 2014, Tim Lillicrap and his co-workers at Oxford and Toronto um, discovered something very surprising. 
they couldn't believe it to begin with. They were using it as a control for something, and suddenly it some, something that shouldn't have worked, and it worked, and they just, yeah, and um, it worked. And this is used in control, and people try using this euro inverse for control. Um, so what they did was they used just random connections coming back instead of the transpose of the forward weights. Now, if you use random connections coming back, your derivatives don't even have the right signs. I mean, they're just random by the time they get to the layer, or they go down one layer. So using random connections coming back, if you now have just updated the weights using those derivatives you projected back, you wouldn't expect it to help. And it doesn't. I mean, that is if you updated the weights from the um, one hidden layer to the next hidden layer using as error derivatives these fake derivatives that you get by taking the derivatives in the last hidden layer and mapping them back through random weights. Yes, I'm going to sh I'm, but I'm going to explain why. Um, so the, the puzzle is, why does it work um, when you map back through random weights? Um, I mean, it, it, I didn't believe it to be this. I went and implemented it, and it works. It doesn't work so well for getting things through narrow bottlenecks, but it works. Um, so for auto-encoders auto with narrow bottlenecks, it doesn't work so well. But if you have a wide layer, it works just fine. Um, it's a bit slower than backprop normally, maybe a factor of two slower. But it gets down to similar errors, so it works really well. It's not that it sort of works a bit. It works really well, almost as well as doing backprop. Um, I'll give you an analogy. There's something else like this that works, which is in variational inference, you try and infer the states of the latent variables, and you use something that infers the wrong states. And then you go off and do learning under the assumption they're the right states. And hey presto, it all works out nicely. It's something that wants to work. And what's really happening is when you learn the generative model, assuming that you got the real posterior distribution, even though you didn't, the generative model will adapt so that your crummy method of doing inference is a bit more correct. And so the generative model contorts itself so as to try and fit in with your appalling way of doing inference. And the whole thing works out not too badly. Um, there's basically two kinds of algorithm in learning, as far as I can see. There's ones where you make some terrible fudge, and it wants to work, so it contorts itself to make your fudge work. And there's others where you make some terrible fudge, and it wants not to work, and it exploits the fact that your fudge is wrong to work really badly. Um, and variational. Contrarian Sorry? That's the contrarian principle. <laughs> yes, but it's not always contrarian, you see. In variational learning, it's not contrarian. Yeah, okay, I like yeah. variational inference is double contrarian. It actually works just to show you you weren't right about the contrarian principle. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is one of those weird things that works when it shouldn't, and works much better than it should. Um, so all I've explained so far is there's other things like this that work when they shouldn't. That doesn't really explain how it works. Um, before I go into explaining how it works, when you use fixed top-down weights, it works. So obviously, if you're slowly changing the top-down weights and the feed-forward weights contract fast enough, it'll still work. Um, and so you should be able to do better than fixed top-down weights. You should be able to slowly change the top-down weights so as to, for example, make the things into better autoencoders. And actually, that works slightly better. It's a small improvement over using fixed top-down weights. But why does using fixed top-down weights work at all? Well, here's a really tricky case. Here's a case that you wouldn't have thought would work. We're going to take MDIS. So we're going to take a handwritten digit. We're going to take 800 rectified linear units and 800 rectified linear units. But they could be sigmoid units. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to use fixed random connections here. We're going to use fixed random sparse connections here. And the way we're going to get them is we take forward connections, and we only put in 25% of them. And then, for all the, neuro, all the pairs of neurons that weren't connected here, we put in a third of the possible connections. So we only have 25% of the top-down connections, too. And there's no overlap. 
So we're back projecting through a fixed random sparse matrix where none of the terms overlap with the forward matrix. Um, that's much more like the brain than the normal backprop net. Um, but then we have connections here. They can be sparse if you like. In this, I didn't make them sparse. But these are adaptive. And the question is, will these adapt in a sensible way? So the experiment goes like this. You try learning where these are fixed, and you just adapt these. And obviously it learns, because what you're doing is taking the input, randomly recoding it to 800 activities here, which is keeping it about the same size, and then you're learning a simple model here. Um, and that, that will learn. That'll get down to about 2.5% error or something. Maybe not quite that good, but it'll get it'll still okay. Um, the question is, if you learn these guys and you learn these guys at the same time, using as your learning signal for these units, the errors you got there, which were correct, back propagated through this fixed random matrix, um, multiplied by the slopes of the nonlinearities here, back propagated through this one, multiplied by the slopes of the nonlinearities here, and those give you your fake derivatives here they're going to use for learning. Does it help? And yes, it helps a whole lot. It uses these connections very nicely and builds nice receptive fields. Um, so something's really working here, even though it's going through these random connections. Um, you have to do things like this to convince yourself that it really is working. It's not because it was so surprising. And now I'm going to give you an intuitive explanation about why it works, at least how it gets off the ground. So what we can do is we can freeze the last layer of weights and just learn the earlier weights. And if we do that, we notice something. When you freeze the last layer of weights that are going to be used to produce, to propagate, to produce um, predictions, which then get sent backwards through random weights, the last layer of weights is actually learning correctly to begin with because it's looking at the output and looking at what's coming in, and it's actually really learning properly. If you turn off that learning, it appears that no learning, will, no useful learning goes on. So if you freeze the last layer of weights and you learn the earlier layers using these fixed random backwards connections, it doesn't improve at all. It just gets slightly worse as you learn. And so you think that it's not actually learning anything, but actually it's learning a lot. What it's learning is not making the error go down. It's not making the output error go down, but it's going to make it much easier for the last layer of weights to learn when you do turn on the So, are you, are you breaking the loop when you turn something off? No, no, the connections are still there, we're just not changing them. But we have four oh, connections yes, from the last layer to the output, they're just not adapting. Okay. So there are loops, yeah, if you didn't do that, it, I don't think it would make sense at all. Um, so, here's what's happening. If you think what happens, for if you've got, say, 10 output classes, I'm going to use the softmax at the output, but this also applies to linear regression. To regression. Um, the actual output will they'll all be about equal if we start off with small weights. Okay, so you have small weights going to the output. They don't have much effect on the output. The actual outputs all look pretty much like that. The desired outputs, when you have the fourth, so a member of the fourth class as the input, um, will look like that. And so the derivative of the error with respect to the input to the final layer of units will look like this. It says if you want to make the error bigger, decrease this guy and increase those guys. Or if you want to make the error smaller, decrease these guys and increase this guy. Um, and notice that if you have different instances of the fourth class that have nothing to do with one another, they're just very different inputs, but they're classified as the fourth class, they will get the same error derivative coming back from the output there. Because the error derivative is determined by the class dominated by what the class is. So now what happens is you take this error, error vector and you map it backwards through the last layer of backwards connections, which are just random weights. And so they'll do some sort of random rotation scaling and stuff of it. But if you had two things that were the same and you map them through a random matrix, they're going to end up the same, pretty much. They're going to end up very similar, unless it's some weird matrix. So what you're getting now is that you get these fake derivatives that come back that are nothing to do with the real derivatives. And if you change the units in that direction, it's not going to make life better for you at the output. 
But for members of the same class, you get the same derivatives, and for members of different classes, you get different derivatives. So all the different members of the same class will try and move the activities in the same direction. And what will happen after you've done a little bit of learning is that all the different members of the same class, even if they had nothing to do with each other, but you designate them as being of the same class. So you could just take random data and just designate the first 10 as being class 1, the next 10 as being class 2, the next 10 as being class 3. They've got nothing to do with each other. But when you turn on the learning now, things that are designated as class 4 will all get the same error vector coming back. And so in the last hidden layer, they'll all learn to have pretty much the same representation. Um, that's basically why it works. That's what's going on when you learn without adapting the last layer. So you can see how this thing's working. It's making things that have the same class have similar representations in the hidden layers. And it's recursive. Um, I'll show you that in a minute. So this is, the, this is an example I implemented. You have frozen but small forward weights there. You have fixed random weights here and you have adaptive random weights there. And you do this, you do backprop, um, treating what comes, the error derivatives here mapped through these fixed random weights as if they were the true derivatives. And as you learn, as you adapt these weights, the error doesn't go down. The error, if anything, goes slightly up. Or it basically stays at random. Um, OK. But when you turn, now turn on the learning there, What's happened is things of the same class here have very similar representations there. And so the learning here is trivial. It learns very fast. Um, so you were actually doing something very useful. You were constructing, reps, you were making representations of things that were the same class be very similar. And it works through multiple layers. Oh, this is just an example of that. This is 100 random vectors, 784. They're random binary vectors of length 784. Um, the first 10 are designated class 1, the next 10 at class 2. I train without adapting. I don't adapt these weights at all. And after training just these weights, if you look at the representations here and measure the covariances between these vectors, you get that. You can see all the, the first 10 all have pretty much the same representation. The next 10 have a very different and pretty much the same representation, and so on. So it's obvious that if that's your representation of the things in the different classes, learning's trivial. And that works through multiple layers. So once the activities in the last hidden layer are very similar for members of the same class, then the slope of the nonlinearity will be very similar for members of the same class. And so now when you take the output error, you put it through one random matrix, you multiply it by the slopes of the nonlinearity, which are the same for all members of the same class, and you put it through another random matrix, you'll get very similar error vectors in the layer below. So it's not just the last hidden layer this works. So as soon as that one's oh God, is act, beginning to get its act together, other ones are learning too. And so you can actually learn lots of layers of representation to make the input get progressively more similar for things designated as the same class, and progressively more different for things of different classes, um, without ever decreasing the error in the output. Um, OK, so just to summarize, the fact that we send the neurons send spikes rather than real numbers isn't a problem. That's just because you've got a huge model with not much data, and having lots of noise is the right thing to do. Um, by representing error derivatives as temporal derivatives, you can get backpropagation to happen automatically if you've got autoencoders. If you first learn a bunch of autoencoders so that you reconstruct at the layer below, um, and then you start changing the signal that's doing the reconstruction and watch how the reconstruction changes. And actually, spiked independent plasticity is what you'd expect to see if you were using this scheme for encoding error derivatives, if the rate of change of the underlying firing rate was what represented the error derivative. You'd have to apply a derivative filter to the spike train and use the output of that derivative filter to control the learning. That's spiked independent plasticity. Um, and the problem that caused me to give up before, which is that you don't have top-down connections that are transposed to the bottom-up connections, well, it works anyway, um, because it's, it's contrarian-contrarian. Um, it's called noise cancel. Okay. 
Okay. So just make it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent presentation. I just wanted to ask a question about uh, representing these two states, the uh, uh, derivative and the activation. Um, in uh, actual neurons, there there's a biochemical activation, right? So it proteins like homogenin that are stored locally in the synapse, or right before the synapse in the presynaptic neuron, and in the postsynaptic neuron. And when the presynaptic neuron fires, and, and it's incident on the postsynaptic neuron, the state of calmodulin biases different biochemical cascades. And it's that state of the protein that changes over time. Right? It's thought to be one of the drivers of long-term plasticity. In other words, it's the variable that's stored in spike chemical plasticity. In your model, are you sort of approximating these sort of biochemical cascades numerically? OK, so the model we've got at present um, we haven't really filled in all the details of this bit. Um, the, the reason I didn't show you a sort of complete simulation of something using entirely spikes and learning and doing backprop is because, as you could probably tell from the presentation, there's still a lot of wiggle room left in exactly how you do the, how you organize the forward pass and then these two backwards passes. Um, and I'd be very interested to read about the biochemical mechanisms. Um, that's what we want to implement, but I think there's still quite a few ways of implementing that. Yeah. So I mentioned that in the first part of the talk, that uh, people at present has 10 to the 14 parameters, and uh, yeah, in fact, 10 to the 9 data samples. So do you think uh, there will be a new theory out there for this regime of such models? And, uh, so for, for deep learning, there is no convincing theory. So what kind of theory? So I, I mean, if I understood the question right, are we going to get sort of new kinds of learning algorithm for this funny regime where you have, you assume computation is almost free, you assume you have a reasonable sized data set, but now because computation is cheap and because you care, you're going to apply a huge amount of computation and have a vast model in the hope that you can generalize better. Um, yeah, I think that's a different regime. It's a regime that's hardly been explored. So I tried it a bit for MNIST. So for MNIST, you've got 60,000 training examples. So you can train a model with 100,000 connections, and it works OK. You train a model with a million connections, it works better. Um, OK, so you train a model with 10 million connections and a good regular, and a regularizer now, and that, works, but that generalizes better. OK, so now you train a model with 100 million connections and a good regularizer. That generalizes even a little bit better. If you were to go to half a billion connections, that would be about the same ratio of parameters to training cases that the brain has. So, but 100 million is getting close. And the point is that 100 million parameters for 60,000 training cases, a statistician would have told you you're completely insane. It's, it will overfit horribly and it will never generalize. And that's just because they didn't have really strong regularizers. It turns out it's better to use more parameters than a strong regularizer. Yeah. Um, you you, you um, um, had certainly um, persuaded me that the brain could do back propagation. You, you suggested that um, it worked so well, and chances are that evolution would have found that. But do you, do you think the brain actually does do pro back propagation, or do you think it's got other tricks up its sleeve which we're still waiting for? I don't to know. <laughs> I, don't know. <laughs> I just object to neuroscientists saying it couldn't possibly do it. Um, and the arguments they give you are I think what's going on, or what was going on until fairly recently. They had all the arguments I gave, plus another argument, which was, and anyway, backpropagation isn't that great. You know, support vector machines work better. Um, so we don't really need to go into this argument, do we? Because backpropagation clearly isn't the answer to everything. But once you've established that backpropagation is actually the answer to everything, um, then it becomes interesting about whether the brain really could do it. And then you start looking at these arguments, and you notice all of the arguments seem like quite good arguments, 
but none of them are insuperable. And so if you really think the brain's got a big motivation for doing it, um, then maybe it can. But of course, there may be some other algorithm that's better than backpropagation. And of course, when you're using these random backwards weights, that's not exactly backpropagation anymore. Um, it's in the same ballpark, but it's not actually backpropagation. Um, so my feeling is it's probably using something like backpropagation, that's maybe not exactly backpropagation, um, because that's what works. And the sort of more general point is that I think there has to be some way in which feature detectors early in the sensory pathway get information about their effects so that the, their effects later on, so that they can adapt to be more useful later on. It seems crazy not to do that. And that's sort of what backpropagation does. And the, there's other ways of doing that that aren't quite backpropagation, like using feedback alignment. Um, that's what I really believe in, that somehow the information is getting back, um, so these things are adapting to be useful. Now, it may be that most of the adaptation is just so they can model what's below them. It's mostly unsupervised. But there has to be some element of adapting to be useful. Yeah. Terry Sanowski, uh, the computation of sense of CS we did. So we have so many. Terry Sanowski taught this computational neural sense of CSD years ago, where he, he taught us to model quanta with discrete packets of neurotransmitter being released from a presynaptic neuron using a Poisson distribution. I was intrigued by your Poisson distribution uh, as a way of sampling uh, Eric Ad instead of using things like dropout. I was wondering if there was any relationship between these two ideas. Um, I guess the relationship is simply that if neurons are behaving somewhat Poisson-like, a lot of that's coming from these discrete quanta because that really is a Poisson process. So a lot of it's in the um, amount of transmitter release that goes on. We know that's very noisy. If you inject charge straight into a neuron, it's much less noisy. Is there any difference between the kinds of errors that come out from the real back, I'll call it the real back propagation, the original one, and the uh, ones that come out of this uh, 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 propagation to make the output be the same as the input? It's a good question, and I don't think anybody's really looked at that. Um, this is all stuff's fairly new, and we've mostly been concerned with why on earth does this stuff work? Um, what's going on? Um, obviously, if there was some significant difference between the kinds of errors they get, you might look for that and see which way people go. But I don't think anybody's really looked at that. They just looked at this kind of error rates. Seems like this makes, the, <coughs> this makes the prediction that the brain is, or that cortical layers are filled with autoencoders, kind of at every layer. Um, do you know if that's actually true? The between layers, it's an autoencoder. Yeah. Um, no, I don't know if it's true. I think it'd be a very good idea, but. <laughs> if you were designing it. <laughs> if I designed it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. There was a recent uh, paper that said that. Uh, uh, neural waves can be encoded in 4.7 bits. Um, I mean, have you uh, any comment on that? Uh, apparently, there, this was a big deal because it's more than they thought it was before. It's 27 states or something. This is for a weight or an activity? A weight? weight uh, uh, and, uh, a weight and a particular uh, connection. Okay. Uh, or, or, or in some cases, I understand that there's several connections to the same, yeah. same neuron. Yeah, the same. But an individual yeah. synapse. Oh, that was the stuff that Terry was involved in, yeah. Um, says it's about 4.7 bits per weight. Um, I don't really have much to say about that. It would be, you know, you could use some pretty simple arithmetic to... Uh, to uh, People already do that. Kind of thing. People who want things to go fast already do use... Um, they use, for example, 8-bit weights. Yeah, that's quite a So uh, I guess that crop gives you the gradient. And in practice, people have been getting some mileage out of you know, doing things like momentum or per feature scaling. So do any of these things exist in the present? Um, a more general question would be, 
you'd really like to sort of combine stochastic gradient descent with something more like a second order method that goes in a better direction. I mean, it's sort of crazy to go and do steepest descent. You'd like to get something more like the natural gradient. And I got very excited about the idea that actually feedback alignment isn't giving you the transpose of the forward matrix. It's giving you the pseudo inverse. And what the, or it's giving you something closer to the pseudo inverse. And so it's saying, what do I have to do to get back to the thing I want to reconstruct? Um, if you train it, you'll get that. So with the pseudo inverse, you can figure out how I would have to change the outputs of neurons in one layer to get rid of the error at the next layer. Um, and that's a bit more like a second order method. Um, that is, it behaves quite differently in extreme cases when you have very high correlations of things. Um, but I didn't manage to get anything to work where you could somehow use the fact it's more like the pseudo inverse to make it more second order. I got very excited about that, but I couldn't get anywhere. I haven't totally given up on it. But. Yeah. Uh, any evidence about the random uh, connection to random weights? As opposed to? No, I mean, in real life frames. <laughs> Is there any evidence for those kinds of edges, or? I, you mean random, I guess you mean random weights that simply yeah, don't adapt. Yeah, I understand, right? They are random edges as well, right? Between yes. Between yeah. So, but they're random in the sense that you don't get detailed one-to-one -one connections. Yeah. But you, the whole thing's full of topographic maps. That, and if an, part of this map connects shit to this map, then this will send connections back to the same place, roughly. So there's locality, but not point-to-point -point locality. And that, so the connections are not random in that sense. That the, yeah. Do you randomly activate the, the, the in that case we've shown there's 25 neurons uh, going one way, 25 going the other, in the middle layer. Uh, do you randomly activate that 25? So it was 25% of the possible connections are there. 25%. But, choose random. 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 but I've also done it where you choose those from, you have topographic maps, and you have a location in this layer, a location of a neuron in this layer, and then you connect it to neurons that have similar locations in the layer below, and you can choose sort of how big you make the neighborhood and how dense you make the connections. And you'd expect that to work better if you're dealing with spatially organized input. Because you expect that if you're dealing with an image, you want to start by processing one part of it locally. But all the connections are there from the full of 400 both ways. All you're doing is randomly selecting which ones are going to fire and which ones are not. Um, but you just do that once. So at the start of the simulation, you decide which connections are there and which aren't. Um, no. As a matter of fact, to make the programming easy, you have them all there, and you let them all learn, and then 75 of them, you set their weights back to zero again. But that's just programming. Have you done anything where you played with a stochastic variation of the number of weights that you feed forward and feed back? So rather than having a fixed sort of 25% delay, um, some no. parts? No, I, just, I mean, we've done very few experiments on the connectivity. We tried local connectivity, and that's nice for images. Um, it's, it's more at the stage of we, we're trying to understand why on earth this works at all. Because on the face of it, it shouldn't work. Like just sort of adding effectively that noise because you're not fully connecting everything, so you're preventing like that fitting possible. <coughs> Maybe, but at least if you don't have backward connections where you have forward connections, you're clearly not doing exactly back propagation. Right. And so the problem isn't so much preventing overfitting as how can it do fitting at all? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, you know, say when an animal goes to a place, the activity of the place will rise and then fall. Mm -hmm. Does that mean sort of before it enters the place, it's the wrong place, and when it leaves the place, it's the right place? If you map time to a river there, how, how would you interpret that? Well, the fire rate goes up, and then the fire rate goes down again. So as it's coming into that location, um, then, yeah. 
Yeah, for that place, though, it's getting more active in terms of that location. And so you'd want to increase the incoming weights on anything that's coming in, and then as it goes out, you want to decrease the weights. Um, and so you'd get, you tend to get this procession, wouldn't you? You tend to get the location moving back towards where it came from. In other words, it'll start predicting rather than... I haven't really thought about that issue. So uh, in the top, so most of the models are using uh, fully connected uh, layers. But uh, another uh, uh, current success of uh, deep learning is also built up on uh, convolutional layers. Mm -hmm. So is there also evidence uh, that like uh, brain is also using uh, mechanics of uh, like ratio sharing like those in convolutional layers, and if uh, that's the case, then is it also is back propagation also feasible in for the mechanism? As far as I know, there's no evidence that the brain is doing any kind of direct So the convolutional layers, I mean convolutional neural networks have two properties. One is they're doing the weight sharing, and the other is they've got these local fields. The brain is of course using the local fields, and that gives you some advantage if, if you've got spatial internet data with local correlations. Um, they can do something a bit like weight sharing indirectly because it's a complicated argument. You look in one place, you develop low level features, those give you higher level features, which give you very high level features, which work over a bigger region. You then look in another place, and if it's not too far away, you know that the high level stuff should be the same. So the high level stuff can give you top down supervision for what the low level features should look like. And you can get sort of information, once you've learned good features here, you get high level stuff. Now I can look over here, and I've got both the input and the high level stuff, which is more or less correct, if it's nearby. So I can get, I should be able to get faster learning because I know both what the input is and what the representation should be like at the higher layer. And then learning is much easier. So in that sense, you can get information coming from features here to transfer across to features here, not by transporting weights, but by the fact that these features told you what the object was, for example, and knowing what the object is helps you learn these features. That's the closest I can think of that the brain could get to which. Uh, just curious, can you repeat your statement about why statistics can't explain uh, how these uh, how things work so well? Okay, my main complaint about statistics, at least in this talk, um, was they've studied models that are in a very different regime from the brain. They studied models where um, the data isn't all that high dimensional and you have not that many parameters and not much data. That's the history of statistics. And what they call big data is, if you have a billion training examples, that's called big data. Um, from the brain's point of view, it's got a billion training examples or more than a billion training examples and it's small data because you've got so many more parameters. So it's in a different regime where it can't just assume that we don't need to worry. I mean, at Google, they're telling me this all the time. They're saying, you don't need to worry about regularization. We've got so much data that it's not a problem. Well, that's just not true. For some of these problems, they've only got a trillion examples. And if you've got 10 to the 15 parameters, that's no good. You better regularize. <laughs> So, in weak sleep as well as in uh, an algorithm based on feedback alignment or using temporal derivatives, it seems like the earlier layers want to wait longer uh, to get an error signal. So, do you have any ideas how the brain might uh, be able to implement these differences in the time scales of the temporal feedback? Uh, <laughs> from, what, from what little neuroscience I know, I think back in the 1960s, they did a course taught by Colin Gettman. Um, and I think you'd expect the earlier feature detectors to have a longer time scale than what they're doing. I think if you want to run quickly, you're going to run what's happening in the later layers. And adapting the earliest layers is a bit like changing the Unix code. I'm mean, quite like conservative about that because it affects everything else. And it's going to, that's going to happen slowly. That's all I have to say. Okay. 
Um, another idea about how you might do get an error signal is you might extract local features and then you might compare what the features in the layer below say a feature detector ought to be doing. So the whole issue is here is you have feature detectors in the intermediate layers and they need to figure out what they should be doing. And one thing to do is say it's going to extract some stuff from below and then it's going to get a prediction from above from the broader context and it wants to make those two the same. It wants to make the prediction from the broader context agree with what it extracts from below. And so a little example of that in a sentence is nice one trial learning. I give you a sentence like this one. She scrummed in with the frying pan and you've never heard the word scrummed before and you have a pretty good idea of what it means in one trial. I think. It's sort of, she bashed him with it somehow, right? Um, probably because of something sexist he said. Um, and what's happening here is there's a certain amount of information in this character string here, these seven characters. Like the ED tells you it's very likely a verb in the past tense of a verb. Um, there may be some information in scrummed, just that, that doesn't sound good. Um, but basically what's happening is the context um, tells you what that's likely to mean. And in one trial, you can get a good idea of, uh, you can get some evidence about what that means. And that's just an example of something you can detect locally, like scrummed, and the context it's in, and you want to make those agree. Okay. A somewhat more principled way to get a learning signal, though not necessarily better, is to say, let's learn a generative model that assigns high log probability to the input data. So for vision, let's learn a graphics model um, that generates things that look like the images we actually see. Um, for complex nonlinear models, that's tricky. But if instead of trying to maximize the log probability of the input data, you try and maximize a variational bound on it, um, then you can make complex models much, more, much easier to learn. And that works pretty well. Um, and if you then are willing to make a further approximation and say, you've got this variational bound that's motivating you, and you're not even going to optimize that, you're going to optimize an approximation to that, you can get a very simple algorithm called the wake sleep algorithm. Um, yes, I was going to put in a description of how it works here, but I can give you the description of how it works. Um, you have some... Oh, actually, no, no, I did animation. I confused myself. Yes, there you go. Um, there's a wake phase where you go forwards um, through these red connections, which are recognition connections. And that, I'm talking for a feed-forward network, not a recurrent network here. For a feed-forward network, you go forwards, someone injects the right answer, you compare it with what you got, and you send something backwards. And there's nobody to inject the right answer in the brain. It's not like your mother has a little electrode into the middle of your brain, much as much though she would like that. Um, a second reason is that cortical neurons don't send real values to each other. And in backpropagation, as is normally used, you're communicating real values in the forward pass and real value derivatives backwards. So Francis Crick was very fond of this reason. He said backpropagation is crazy. Um, neurons don't communicate real values, and so it can't be doing it. Um, the next argument, which I think is one of the best arguments why it can't be done, is to do it in the obvious way, neurons would need to send two different signals. When you go forwards, a neuron sends a signal that says this feature is here, or this feature is here to this extent. So that's the activity of the neuron, that's what it represents. When you're going backwards, that same neuron needs to send a completely different signal, which is how fast would the error change if I were to change my total input that I received from the layer below? That's a completely different quantity. And obviously the neuron can't be sending both quantities. Um, I'll refer to the output of the neuron as Y and the total input to the neuron as X. And so on the forward pass, it needs to send y, and on the backward pass, it needs to send de by dx. And the last thing is, back propagation, you, in backpropagation, you go forwards through the weights, and then you go backwards through the same weights. So in matrix terms, you use the transpose of the forward matrix to send the error derivatives backwards. And there's lots of evidence in the brain that if you have two cortical areas and there's forwards connections, there will be backwards connections. And if there's forwards connections from one region of a cortical area, there will be backwards connections to that region of the cortical area. But they're not point to point. 
So if a neuron here sends a forwards connection there, it's not that this neuron sends a backwards connection there. In fact, the backwards connections go to different neurons. So um, that seems like a major problem. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just go through these four arguments and show how the main aim of this talk is to show none of them are really insuperable obstacles. And when you combine that with the idea that we now know it works really well, it suddenly becomes plausible, I think, that the brain might be doing something that's backpropagation or something very close to backpropagation. So first, the source of supervision. Um, people doing backpropagation have worried about this problem for a long time. And in the 80s, we thought that, well, one way to get a source of supervision is to do reconstruction. So you're trying to encode the data and then reconstruct the data. And you take the reconstruction error and backpropagate it. So you don't need an extra supervision signal. You're just trying to reconstruct the data. That's what PCA is doing, and backpropagation is just nonlinear PCA. The learning algorithm had the exact derivatives of the variational band with respect to the generative weights, but not with respect to those recognition weights. And then Max Welling and the student of his called Kingma came up with a very clever trick that allowed that I'm amazed that you can do it, that allowed you to actually get the exact derivatives. That is something whose expected value is the exact derivative. And so now people can learn these variational autoencoders much better. Um, there's also other new methods of doing unsupervised learning, or rather sort of getting a supervision signal without being given a separate supervision signal. So Ian Goodfellow and his collaborators have a thing called generative adversarial nets, where you have a net that generates data, let's suppose it's images, and to begin with, it doesn't generate very good images, it generates rubbish. You have another net that looks at real images and looks at the images generated by this net. And it has to tell you whether what it's just seen is a real image or an image that came from this net. So it's learning to tell the difference between what the net produced and what real images look like. So it's an adversary. And now if you back propagate through the adversary, you can figure out how to change the generated images so it's harder for the adversary to tell the difference between them and real images. So you get a signal that tells you how to generate images that are more difficult to distinguish from the real ones, according to this adversary. But if you now keep learning the two together, it starts generating really good images. If you show it lots and lots of scenes of bedrooms and just the furniture, and um, you then get it to generate, it generates things that are not particularly like any of the scenes it's seen, but you look at them and you say, that's a bedroom. It's amazing. Um, okay, so there's lots, new, lots of new unsupervised learning algorithms coming up. And my conclusion from all this, I'm not going to pick one of them as the best way to get a supervision signal. But my conclusion is there's many different ways to get supervision signals that you can use with backpropagation. Um, so we don't actually have to inject a separate label. So that objection doesn't really kill backpropagation. There's lots of other ways you can get signals that you backpropagate that will allow you to do learning. So that's not a major objection. Now the next objection, can neurons communicate real values? Um, so normally when you do backpropagation, you send a real number forwards, that's the output of a unit, and um, you also send real numbers backwards, which are error derivatives. But as a matter of fact, people didn't try this for a long time. If you take logistic units, which are sending, they're between zero and one. So a lot of the work I'm going to talk about today was done jointly with Timothy Lillicrap. As I talk, my voice will get weirder and weirder um, because I've got a small polyp growing on one vocal cord. And as I talk, my, I'll start producing two notes at the same time. Um, so backpropagation, just to be sure you all know, takes an input vector. You go forwards through a multilayer neural net with nonlinear units. You compare with the correct answer. You backpropagate something backwards, and derivatives, and then you adjust all the weights. And Despite what people thought for a long time, it works great. Um, if you're interested in it for the brain, then you would do um, online stochastic learning. That is, you would take a training example, you go forwards, you go backwards, and you update the weights a little bit. And in statistical terms, you're getting an exp 
expectation of the full gradient. That is, you get a noisy version of the full gradient from just one training case. On average, it's right. Um, of course, it's a long way off. Um, and that learning technique you'd have thought was crazy, but actually it works quite well, as long as you don't learn too fast. So the question is, could the cortex be doing this? And if you talk to neuroscientists, or look at the things neuroscientists have said over the ages, um, they're, until very recently, they were all completely convinced that this was crazy. Most of them didn't understand what you meant because they thought backpropagation meant sending um, spikes backwards down the um, dendritic tree. And they, that is backpropagation. That's a different form of backpropagation. And you need that for doing many of these algorithms. And they didn't understand that it was the idea of backpropagation was to send error derivatives from one cortical area to an earlier cortical area. Um, it's the right thing to do. And it seems to be completely crazy. It would be completely crazy for evolution not to figure out a way of modifying early feature detectors so that they're useful for later feature detectors. We can all think of a dumb algorithm for doing that, which is you change them at random, see if it helps, but that's hopeless and efficient. Bank propagation is just that dumb algorithm, change them and see if it helps, except that it's more efficient by a factor of the number of connections. So if you've got a billion connections, it's a billion times more efficient than tinkering with the weights at random. Um, and so you'd have thought evolution would have discovered that. Um, but neuroscientists actually have a bunch of good reasons why it's not possible. And I'm going to go over four of those reasons. I don't know whether the brain can do backprop. But what I do know is the arguments neuroscientists use um, aren't very good. Um, so the first reason is there's no obvious source of supervision. In backpropagation, you that determines the activities of these hidden layers. And then you do learning of the other connections. So now we're going to learn these connections. And we're going to train these to be good at reconstructing whatever it was in this layer that caused it. So whatever it was in H2 that caused the pattern in H3, you try and reconstruct it from the pattern in H3. You do a reconstruction, you look at the error, and you change these weights to get rid of that error. And notice there's no backpropagation needed here. That learning can be done sort of at a synapse here. It sees um, the state of H2 um, that was there previously. It sees the state of H2 that's there when it does the reconstruction. And it gets as input on um, the activity of H3. And so you can learn this synapse here without having to do backprop. And that really is uh, the, the right thing to learn um, to maximize the probability of regenerating this from that. Um, and you can do that sort of independently of all the layers. And then the, wake fa the sleep phase, what you do is you generate data from your model. So I start with random vectors up here generated according to the biases of these units. I generate downwards. And then, for each pair of layers, I try and reconstruct what actually caused this activity in the layer above. And I assume independence. It's a variational method, so I make an assumption there. I assume these are independent causes of this. Um, or rather, in the posterior, they're independent. And so you get a very simple learning algorithm. It's not actually following the derivative of the variational bound, because unfortunately, the variational bound is a KL of QP, where Q is your approximating distribution, and P is the right distribution. And this is optimizing um, KL PQ. But it works pretty well. Um, and it's very simple. There's no backpropagation required. And so in 1995, we were quite excited about that, that we had an alg algorithm that could learn multiple layers of representation without doing any backpropagation. And it worked. Um, moderately well. It learned sensible layers of feature detectors. But it wasn't as good as real backprop. Um, so you'll notice the training of these weights and training of those weights uses exactly the same process. Now there's some crazy things about it, like when you're awake, you don't learn the recognition connections. We really thought this was wake and sleep. And when you're asleep, um, you don't learn generative connections. Um, so that means you get to the end of a day, and you haven't learned to recognize things any better during the day. You have to go to sleep. Um, that doesn't seem plausible. Half asleep. Yeah, half asleep. Um, well, you could alternate. Maybe. There's new methods for unsupervised learning. So the problem we had that led to the wake sleep algorithm, and that meant it wasn't doing quite the right thing, was that for this deep net, we couldn't get the exact derivatives of the variational bound with respect to the recognition weights. 